Hello everybody and welcome to another Houdini tutorial. My name is Kate and today we're going to be covering guided RBD sims as well as emit from RBD and you know overall RBD techniques that you can use. So let's get started. Uh, today we are going to be using or creating this little effect that you see in front of you right now which is a combination of three different simulations. The main being a guided RBD sim that it, while the character is walking forward he's falling down and the other is an emit from RBD as you can see the rocks that are emitting down under his feet and that are being emitted per frame. And then we also have a particle simulation which is getting scattered on top of the rocks. So let's take a look at all that. So we're going to go and we're going to turn off all these layers because I currently don't need to look at them. I'm going to got, dive into a geometry node and I'm going to start like walking through all of these nodes and how to create all of them. Now this might seem a little bit overwhelming so I'm just going to delete this main network box and delete that. Um, this is a setup that I've previously set up for a different um, kind of demonstration of guided RBD. So we're just going to be walking through node by node. So the first piece of geometry that you need is a test geometry of Craig. For this particular demonstration, you still need the animation on Craig. You just need to turn off the hammer and turn off the shader. Um, since we're, if we were working with the shader, we would be able to see it when we turn on our material tab, but we're going to turn it off for now. The second node you're going to add is a convert node. So this is going to convert Craig to polygons and you're going to see how he's now changed and you can see kind of UVs across him. You're also going to drop down a null and you're going to label this animation. The reason we want to make sure this is labeled is because we want to use this for our guide later. Being, that's being fed into the RBD bullet solver. Then as you can see here, there's another separate stream coming off of Craig. If we go over here, we have a time shift. We are currently freezing Craig on frame one. And so if after doing this, he won't move. The way you can set this is that I'm just going to paste, turn this back to default so you can figure out how this is how the time shift would look if you would bring it directly into Houdini. But what you need to do is you need to right click, delete channels, and that should make him stay at frame one. Then you are going to convert him to polygons because now we need to fracture Craig. I am using a Voronoi fracture for this experiment because I find it works pretty well. So if we go to scatter here, um, the Voronoi fracture needs two inputs, one that has points and one that has geometry coming into the first input. So we're going to go over to the points and as you can see, I've scattered about 34 points across Craig. The next input, I've connected the geometry over here and the points over here. So after clicking the Voronoi fracture, we should see some main kind of breaks in Craig. And that brings us down to our now infamous node <laughs> called the exploded view, which is incredibly useful to make sure your fractures are working correctly. So if you go to our exploded view, you can see that our fractures are working and Craig is broken into several different pieces like that. Now, if this wasn't on and I turned this off, Craig is in many different pieces, but he looks a little bit weird. And I would say that Voronoi almost keep, makes him keep his shape a little bit more. So we're going to go down to our RBD bullet solver. And this is the fun bit. So now you get to add this into your scene. So I'm going to click this here and Houdini is going to load. Now, it's okay if you see these error messages error out. I've noticed this happen. Um, I'm not sure what is directly causing it. I have seen the error message and <laughs> it could be because we're missing that third input uh, because we're not using an RBD material fracture. So it will still work, don't mind it. So as you can see here, I've plugged in Voronoi into the first input and the constraint from Voronoi into the second. And we are going to do something. I'm going to go to the main solver tab so you can see where we kind of got started with this. So you can see that starting on frame one, solver and everything on this bullet object tab is all normal. 
scrolling down, we've kind of increased the density of Craig to the 2000, reduced the bounce, and up the friction. Then on the collisions tab, we have used collisions turned on because we would like that to happen. And I have also made sure it's he's on animated static objects. And we haven't really played around with the collisions too much. For the ground, we've turned on the ground plane, so we can have that ground plane appear. If this is if the ground plane is off, your scene will look like this. The ground plane on, and this is what height field kind of looks like because you do need to plug in your height field. We're going to go to the fun tab, and the fun tab is called guided simulations. And guided simulations is this is what makes your static object move with your animated object. So if we turn off use guides, the guided simulation will not, or the animation will not affect Craig. He should just break and fall straight down. So that's what the guides are for. So as you can see, he doesn't move, he's static, and he just crumbles. But if we turn on guides and we play it back, we should notice Craig follow his original animation. This method is very much more efficient than basically fracturing an animated geometry directly and putting it through RBD. It can be very tiresome and very inefficient to do that. So as you can see, he's now walking forward. So over here, we have a few different settings, velocity and blend. So method velocity is the default settings for the simulation settings. And bl what blend allows you to do is blend between the static object that you're bringing into the first input and the animation that you're bringing into the guided input. So one is like full-on guided simulation and zero is full-on static simulation. Down here on the guide release thresholds, these are the things that allow for the guided simulation to allow your simulation to start fracturing. So by playing with these different settings, it will cause the fractures to happen at different times or happen differently. So you can play with all these different ones if you feel like it. And if you're feeling very creative, you can dive inside and add forces here. So that's pretty much it. And the next step of this is just to cache it out. So playing this back, we have Craig walking for it and collapsing. And it should be very easy to sim out because Craig is relatively low poly and we didn't really need to subdivide him. So after this, I've kind of added a null that says out sim. And this is the main null that you will actually be grabbing when you come up to the surface here. So I'm just going to color that yellow. Now there's two things you want to do with now your animated pieces. One of them is create the particles, and now we also have to create that secondary RBD sim and our collision objects that we need in those simulations. So let's start with creating our collision objects. So what I always like to do is I like to cheat a little bit when it comes to collision objects. So I like to go select the object that I would like to turn into a collision object, go over to my collisions tab, and click deforming objects. This will bring me up to the surface level of my nodes, and then I can select the node I want and click enter. This will allow Houdini to think itself out and create a new collision object right there. So that's kind of how I do it, and that's how I created the nodes down here. So I'm going to click control Z and get rid of this because I no longer need it. So if you do that step after or after you create a pop net, um, you're going to have a better time. So because as soon as you create your collision source or it should automatically also place a collision object inside your pop net if you have it there. And it should appear like that right here. So let's take a look at our collision source. So for our collision source, we have a var voxel size at 0.01, .01, and we're not filling the interior, but we're just doing that, and those are our settings. Everything else is good. We've then saved him out in our file cache, and then everything else is normal. So let's focus on the second uh, kind of node path. So if you jump over here, there's this handy dandy delete node. And you're noticing that it's deleting um, everything but really the inside pieces. So it's taking the group outside generated from our pieces and it's deleting that selected one. So we're just keeping the inside faces of Crick. Then we are scattering color across these pieces because 
we want to vary our emitter for our particles and that color should be picked up fairly easily. So you can play with these settings as much as you want. The next thing you're going to do is add a scatter. And what the scatter is going to do, it's going to scatter points across Craig, like that. And it's going to base the density attribute off CD. The next thing you're going to do is add a pop net. In this pop net is where your particles are generated. So if you go to the simulation tab, we are starting this on frame one, and we dive inside, and we have our collision objects on this side and a ground plane, which I'll get to shortly. But we're gonna focus on the source first input. So if you go to the source tab, you can see that I'm using emission type points and geometry source first input. If we go to the birth tab, I have kept the life expectancy settings. I have cranked up the constant birth rate. And basically for these two tabs, I am on my impulse activation, I'm going at dollar F before frame 70. So this activation will stay on but after frame 70, it should turn off. So I'm just going to play back the simulation so you should get the idea. But I've also, what I've also done is I've copied relative references into the constant activation channel. So I'll show you how I did that after this cooks back. It should be a few seconds. So there you go. There's our particles emitting up until frame 70 and then turning off. And you can see that happen here. So I've copied relative references into this channel and I can do that by right click copy parameter, and then go to constant activation, right click, paste relative references. Down here, I've added a pop wind. So I've played with the amplitude and swirl size, and what this is going to do, is gonna help the particles fall and make it look less uniform and take away any spacing that makes it look weird. On the solver, I haven't changed anything. It is completely normal pop object, the only thing I've really played with is the physical properties. So I've turned off the bounce and bounce forward and the friction is also at zero, but this is just gonna help the particles stay still when they hit the ground. I've also added a gravity node down here and this is just gonna add some constant forces on our particles falling. Over here is our guided sim, which is our collision objects for our character. I've made sure all of these settings are turned on because I want the transformations to move with the particle. I'm making sure I have my volume sampling on and my by size. On the physical tab, I have not changed much, um, but if you're finding that the particles bounce off of the character too much, you can turn down the bounce and bounce forward. Now for the ground plane. One way to add a ground plane once you're in a pop network is to go up to your collisions tab and go ground plane. And this should add a new ground plane into your scene and then it should appear on the surface level. I'm going to delete that because we already have one in the scene, but that's how you do it. And that's pretty much the basics of setting up this particle simulation. When you are at, rend at the rendering stage for this, I would also recommend you create something called P scale on the particles. So when it's render time, you don't have massive particles rendering. Now we have something called attribute delete. And we're deleting every attribute that we don't need. So I'm getting rid of everything but velocity and just that. Then I'm adding delete where I am deleting, I'm gonna hide all my other objects. I'm going to delete everything but my stream source input, lean on selected, and points. So now we can actually see the playback of our particles, and we won't see our collision objects. Then I have cached this out into a particle net, like that. Then I have out particles here, and this is the null that you're going to grab when you go to render. So I'm going to color that yellow. The next thing we're going to talk about is the emit RBDs. So if we play this back, we should have a pile of rocks that just spouts over time, like that. So up here, there are two inputs that you're going to want to start with. One is a grid. So you're going to want to drop down a grid and you're going to want to give it about the same rows and columns each side. So I've chosen one, two, three, or 123. Then I've given it a color of black. So we're gonna color that black. Then we're gonna jump over here to our object merge. And what we're going to do is we're going to grab the sim over here because we need that as a different transmitter of color. So we're taking our character that's fallen down and we are going to be transferring the color from it onto our grid. 
So we have color here and we've added this red color to our character. We've then added a solver down here. And if we play back the solver, something cool should happen. So you can see that these little areas are now red. And if we dive inside, we see that we've had something from the previous frame. We are grabbing from input two and we have an attribute transfer down here. We are transferring a distance threshold of 0.01. .01. If we go to the attributes, we're just taking all of the attributes, specifically the color, and transferring it onto the ground plane. I'm just going to delete that. So now we have our scatter. And what we're going to do is scatter points into the red areas of the grid. And we have a density attribute of CD and a total force count of 10. Then we have a attribute randomize of P scale and min and max value. Then we have something called an attribute wrangle at orient at rand at PT num, which is essentially saying orientation is equal to random point number. Then we have a copy to points. And as you can see here, it's copying a bunch of things to points. Above it, we have a sphere. So this sphere has a uniform radius of 0 0.2, radius of 0 0.5, 0.5, 0.5. And we have a mountain that's making it into this kind of rocky shape. And you can play with this as much as you like until you get it right like this. And then you're going to plug it into your copy points. And it should inherit the color of the points, but we don't want that very much. So what we're going to do is just put down another attribute delete and delete the color. We're also going to do that the same. Um, we're going to do that with, with our collision object as well. Over here, you might see another attribute delete. So what you're going to do is up here where you had your character coming in with color like this, you're going to just quickly slide down and attribute delete beneath it to delete the color off of it because we want to pump that into our RBD solver down here. Now back over to this side. Over here we have a switch. I've decided that I don't want the rocks to emit past frame 83. So after frame 83, this switch will switch back over to one, which will activate this null, which is nothing. Now back to our RBD solver. This RBD solver is fairly fun. Now, if we go to our solver tab, we can see that this is starting at frame one. I would even adjust it more so we can have these start later after it's fully started moving. But that's just me. I've upped the stub step, sub steps to 23. I've gone to bullet object and I've turned on emit RBDs. So we emit something per frame. Scrolling down, I've turned off collision padding and I've upped the density and the bounce just a little bit and the friction. I've then gone to the collision tab and I've gone to initial object type, create deforming up static objects. Then I've cranked up the bounce as well. Then at the ground plane, I've turned on ground plane and turned down the bounce. And that was pretty much it for this particular one. And then I saved it out. So after saving it out, you can see these just scatter everywhere. And you might be wondering why they're still moving is because if we were to turn on our main sim and take a look at this, and I'm going to show all objects, you can see that these are getting pushed around by the other pieces that are flying downwards. So that motion is consistent with the rest of the simulation surrounding it. Now down here after your file cache, you're going to add another null that says out to freeze. And then you're just going to color it yellow because that's what you're going to grab for these three object merges in each of these right here. And that's pretty much it for this Houdini tutorial. My name is Kate and I will see you in the next video. Bye.